we're delighted this morning to have as our special guest the Reverend Phil Schrader from our North Georgia Conference office. Phil is with us today to lead and share with us in our visioning session. As Katie mentioned earlier, that will follow promptly our 11 o'clock worship services. Hope that uh, many of you will be able to be here shortly after 12 o'clock to be a part of that study. A lunch is being provided. Uh, your presence and your participation are vitally important. The reading of scripture this morning is taken from the Old Testament, from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. As you're able, if you'll please stand for the reading of God's word. Let us now hear the word of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongues. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's bow together for a moment of worship. Eternal God, our Father, how blessed are we that we're able to gather this early morning on this Lord's Day in your presence, in your house, with these, our loved ones in Christ. Father God, enable each and all of us to be able in these moments to worship you, to commune with you. Father, grant that in our worship, we would be enabled to hear that still small voice of God. And Father, as we hear your word, as we discern your voice, Father, use us, we pray, as the body of Christ to communicate what we hear, what we know, what we've experienced to our world, beginning here at home in our own community. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever noticed that Sunday morning church services are often called preaching services instead of worship services? Now, does that mean if for some reason we don't resonate with the preacher, then we don't worship? As a pastor teacher, I deeply appreciate the significance and importance of a biblically based sermon. But suppose you don't like the sermon or that you don't respect or appreciate the preacher. Is that hour wasted? Has worship been short-circuited? Just exactly, what is worship? Is worship the mechanics of what we do in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning? Is worship the printed order of service? Is worship basically a matter of ritual and liturgy? Is worship an event or an experience. Please know that when authentic worship occurs, there is that divine human encounter. In our scripture lesson from Isaiah chapter 6, there is the record of a glorious worship experience. You will note in our text that without any sermon being preached that particular day, a young man ceased to be simply a spectator and became an active participant in the worship of God. 
Beloved, that very same thing will happen in our lives once we understand the dynamics of worship. This morning I want us to consider at least four dynamics of worship. May these dynamics, these principles of worship, encourage our communion and our fellowship with God. First, worship, worship presupposes intention. For authentic worship to occur, there must be the previous and prior intent to reverence and to commune with God. Worship is not incidental nor accidental. Indeed, a person's intention becomes the very foundation of what will or will not happen in the context of worship. And so it is in Hebrews 11:6, we're told, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek his face. In James 4, verse 8, the writer says, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. In the Old Testament from Deuteronomy 4.29 we're told, Seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with your whole heart and with all your soul. And then from the lips of our Savior in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. When we truly want to meet God, we shall know that divine human encounter. When we truly seek to worship God, we shall hear his voice. We shall feel his presence. Indeed, we shall feel the very touch of his spirit upon our hearts. Such was the experience of young Isaiah in the temple as reported in our scripture lesson. To set in context that particular event in Isaiah's life, good King Uzziah, a cousin of young Isaiah, had died. Apparently, Isaiah and the king were extremely close. With the death of good King Uzziah, Isaiah and all of his contemporaries, indeed the whole land of Judah, found themselves in a time of sorrow and grief. And for young Isaiah, just a teenager, it was a time of soul searching. He was beside himself. He needed answers. Perhaps following the funeral and burial of good King Uzziah, young Isaiah had returned to the palace. He had been there numerous times in his visit with his cousin, good King Uzziah. The palace, though well known to Isaiah, though beautiful and attractive, was now silent and empty. Perhaps from the palace, Isaiah went to the infirmary where for several months the king had suffered the dreaded illness of leprosy. There in that infirmary, Isaiah recalled the images of his cousin suffering and finally dying. And perhaps from the infirmary, Isaiah went back to the cemetery where he and others had witnessed the burial of his cousin. From the cemetery, Isaiah made his way to the temple where earlier that day they had gathered for the service. There in that temple, perhaps alone, but in solitude in his own mind and heart, suddenly it happened. There in that temple, as he sat in solitude and silence, as he was wrapped in grief and hurt and doubt, there, as many of us have experienced, a numbness of body, mind, and soul. It happened. Suddenly, he was swept away from all the sights and sounds of the temple. He was swept into the very presence of Yahweh, the Lord God of Judah. This king who had been dear to Isaiah, but now had died, was gone. And in this vision of Yahweh, the Lord God, Good King Uzziah was replaced by a vision of a greater king, a king who would always be there for those who would seek his face. Like young Isaiah, we too shall see the Lord. We too shall hear his voice when we purposely seek and search to know him, whether then 
or now. A healthy contemplation of worship does not embrace shallow, selfish, or superficial motives. Thus superstition, fear, and manipulation are never the foundations of authentic worship. Neither, dear friends, is habit or tradition or social customs. For worship to occur, there must be that prior intention to meet God, to interact with God, to experience God. I wonder how many of us are here today and how many people are in morning worship simply out of habit. How many people are preparing for church this morning and anticipating going to church because it's the expected thing to do? How many will find themselves in the sanctuary or in a hall of worship because deep down they fear that something bad might happen if they do not go to church? How many people unconsciously regard worship attendance as a magical rabbit foot? How many people go to church thinking that by going to church somehow they obligate God to themselves? That by going to church God is indebted to us. But also in our Western culture, how many people primarily go to church to see and to be seen? How many people will find themselves in a worship setting this morning out of a desire to make social contacts, out of a concern for upward mobility? How many times in the years of my ministry upon visiting with a newcomer or a prospect has a person told me, Pastor, I'm told that if I go to your church, it will be good for my business or for my practice. How many of us are here this morning in this setting of worship because we want to be here to be touched and cleansed and inspired afresh by God? Deep down in our souls, we know we know the purpose and the reasoning behind our presence. Oh, that we would gather here to worship God, to experience that fresh divine human encounter, to worship God in spirit and in truth. Did not Christ tell us God is spirit and those who would worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth? It's essential that we understand the dynamics of worship. For worship just doesn't simply happen. Worship is the result of several dynamics. The first of these, worship presupposes intention. Secondly, worship demands meditation. Meditation requires mental concentration and especially spiritual stillness. In moments of meditation, young Isaiah found himself alone with God. Now keep in mind, Isaiah is probably 15, 16, 17 years of age. He's a Jew. He's a member of the royal family. He has heard about God. He knows about Yahweh. He has been brought up and nurtured in the faith of Israel. God is no stranger to him, theoretically. Very likely this was the first authentic encounter with God himself. In this encounter, he meets and experiences God and doesn't simply hear about God. In those moments of meditation along with God, suddenly the earthly scene has faded. Everything else, including his grief, has become secondary. All the earthly distractions and clamor have now dissipated. When will we learn that our experience of worship, like that of Isaiah's, does not depend upon the sacred desk, nor upon the choir loft, nor upon any other matter or agenda? Indeed, our experience of worship, yours and mine, depends on each of us individually. Our ability, our potential, our capacity to worship depends upon our own state of spiritual readiness and the sensitivity of our heart. 
No wonder, one of the pivotal verses in all of Holy Writ, Psalm 4610, be still, be still and know that I am God. And in the Hebrew, that, that admonition, be still, connotates not just a cessation of physical activity, it means much more than simply being physically still. It denotes a stillness of heart and mind and soul. It is a sensitivity. It involves surrender, submission. Be still in every dimension of your being. And in that stillness, that purposeful stillness, no that God is God. Biblical meditation is the purposeful process of directing our attention, our affection, and our devotion to God, who is the sole object of our faith. I suggest that our meditation for worship should begin even before the formal services commence. Indeed, I suggest that on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, the first day of the week, as we emerge from our rest, as we get out of bed, as we begin our preparation for that day, even as we put our feet on the floor, we should acknowledge this is the Lord's day. And in this day we shall rejoice and be glad. And as Christians, as the body of Christ, as the assembly of believers, we know that on the Lord's day we have an appointment with God to be in his house, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Meditation should begin before we ever get to the church house. And as we take our places in the hall of worship in the Lord's house, that meditation should continue in acknowledging to God and self our own undoneness, our own woefulness, our own need of God, and then praying for the service, praying for those that are gathered with us, praying for those that are going through difficult and demanding situations. In these preliminary moments, we prepare our hearts, our very spirits. We look to God, seeking afresh His face and His favor. Our worship experience, whether this morning or any day, is always correlated to our meditation, both before and during the worship experience. A third dynamic or principle of worship, worship produces revelation. The eternal sovereign God of heaven and earth wants to reveal himself to us. The very nature of God is always self-giving, self-sharing. God wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to reveal his divine truth to those who seek his face, to those who want to know him, to those who want to worship him. And dear friends, let us never forget that we know only of God what God has chosen to reveal. We are always recipients of revelation. We do not generate that revelation. God is the source. We are the recipient. As we become ready and prepared and receptive to appropriate, God is there willing to give, to provide that new insight, that fresh discernment, that understanding of his will and his mind for our lives. But always know that true revelation is progressive and sequential. How many times have you turned to a passage of scripture and you read it and you see something there, you discern something that you've never felt or realized before? You've perhaps read that scripture dozens if not hundreds of times previously. But on that day, as you open that divine word, as you read that passage, suddenly it speaks and there is that fresh revelation to you. As to God, his mind, his word, his will for your life. Authentic revelation is always progressive and sequential. 
So it was in Caesarea Philippi, just a few months before his death on the cross, Jesus in that respite with his disciples asked them this pivotal question, who am I to you? Peter and the other disciples had been with Christ almost three years. And at this late hour, Jesus raises this ultimate question, who am I to you? And without any hesitation or equivocation, Simon Peter answers, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was pleased. And as he smiled, he said to Simon, Simon, son of John, blessed are you for flesh and blood, mind, reason, logic, rationality did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Isaiah's threefold vision, as recorded in our text, demonstrates the nature of revelation. His revelation, his vision, had three distinctive parts. The first part was the vision of Yahweh, the Lord God. Isaiah says, And I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the hem of his robe, his train, filled the temple, and smoke, signifying the glory, the presence of God, overwhelmed the place of worship. In this vision of the Lord, young Isaiah saw God as exalted and sovereign and holy and righteous and omnipotent in worship. We seek not to see ourselves, nor those seated next to us. We seek to see God, to experience His presence, His transcendence. Secondly, in his vision, young Isaiah saw a vision of self. As a result of seeing God, he saw himself. And beloved, that holds true for any and every person, including us. We only see ourselves realistically, authentically, as a result of first having seen God. And as Isaiah saw himself as a young teenager, immediately he cries out, Woe am I! I'm undone! Woe is me! For I am lost. I'm a person of unclean lips. His cry as a result of his vision of self, constitutes the primal scream. When we see ourselves as we are, as God sees us, it provokes that cry of experiential self-discovery. I'm not who I thought I am. I'm not the person that I project myself to be. In this cry of self-discovery, this primal scream, we take off the mask. We see ourselves as we are. In the words of Isaiah, all of us are woeful. We're sinful. Again, it is only when we see the Lord that we can correctly see ourselves. Thirdly, the vision, the revelation, was a vision of his contemporaries, his neighbors, his community. For he continues, and I dwell in the midst of a people who also have unclean lips. They are just like I am in this worship, in this vision, this revelation. Young Isaiah looks up, away and above and beyond himself. And after seeing God, he looks within. And then he looks without and about. Isaiah realized he was not the only one in this predicament. He is in the midst of numerous other fellow strugglers. But instead of being judgmental, castigating, and critical, he finds himself now moved with compassion, with love, with concern. Because he had known firsthand the crippling and corrupting power of sin, he could now understand and love and care for and accept his fellow strugglers as they were. No longer imposing expectations or stipulations, but now reaching out and embracing people as they were and as they are. And beloved, for us, when authentic worship happens, 
we behave precisely as young Isaiah did. Instead of being harsh and cruel and exclusive and condemning, we find ourselves loving people, caring for people, wanting what is best for them. When worship happens in here, it is readily apparent out there by how we treat and interact with our fellow strugglers. Yes, worship, pre worship presupposes intention. Worship demands meditation. Worship produces revelation. And fourthly, worship culminates in commitment and service. The Heavenly Father is always confronting and challenging the worshiper. He confronts and challenges us with a call to commitment, to service, to servanthood, and to discipleship. In the context of worship, young Isaiah heard, after having seen God, he heard the voice of God. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God's voice can be heard when we become conscious of his presence. And to hear the very voice of God, that must be the intent of our hearts. We hear the voice of God when we become still and sensitive and submissive and surrendered. God is not going to break in. He's not going to bend us by the arm until we holler, Uncle. God is waiting for us to give him that moment, that opportunity to intervene, to reveal, to connect with us. Decision and acceptance to God's call are always our privilege and our responsibility. When Isaiah heard the call of God, immediately he answered, Here am I, send me. Now in the Hebrew, there is great emphasis. It's almost like young Isaiah had a red flag and he began to wave it with all of his energy. God, I'm just a young man, but I'm willing. Here am I. Send me. In the context of worship, in that connection, in that interaction, Isaiah did not try to bargain with God. He didn't try to get the most religion for the least devotion. He didn't hold back waiting for a more convenient time. No, at the moment, he surrendered. He embraced. Convinced of God's love and forgiveness, we too should cry out, here am I, O oh God, send me, use me, anoint me. It is my prayer that the hot coal which touched Isaiah's lips and cleansed his heart will also touch our lips, cleansing our hearts and indeed our lives. It may be that in our worship this morning, in God's revelation to you, in your searching for him, you hear that tender knock upon your heart. You hear the whisper from the Savior, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and I'll eat with, and I'll eat with you and you with me. In worship, God reveals. He manifests himself. It is our decision, our great prerogative, to invite God into the confines of our very life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.